Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good um, afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm sorry because we have to do uh, uh, an asynchronous lecture today. Um, supposedly, the original plan is for us to have um, initially two synchronous lecture um, on Monday or Wednesday, but on Wednesday I was sick. I, I had very bad stomach ache. Um, so um, I'm planning to do one synchronous today. And then um, this Wednesday, we'll, we'll start to have our asynchronous lecture. Okay. Um, and then uh, I will post two videos. So one is for the other asynchronous last week. So instead of posting it last week, um, I was thinking of doing it today because it's a bit heavy. Okay. Um, and um, if you do, if you can't follow whatever I'm talking about, do let me know so that we can stop and, you know, discuss about it a little bit and um, if I am not be able to finish all the 30 slides by today um, I'll just put whatever extras as part of uh, the asynchronous lecture okay so today we are going to talk uh, we're we going to uh, look at topic number two which is um, enzymes or um, we call it as in vitro technologies for biotechnological processes so if you do have any issues, um, learning issues, learning difficulties, um, say, for example, if your laptop suddenly broke down or um, you have uh, unhealthy learning environment, for example, the space at home is not conducive, um, the place in, in colleges, if you are actually staying in colleges, which I don't think so, unless if you are PM, um, if the space at home or colleges are not conducive enough, Say you have a small room uh, and you are sharing your room with another siblings that also have a lecture. Um, do let me know uh, about your issues if you do have them and um, suggest what can we do, what can I do or the, the department do to improve your learning condition. If you do have them, let us know. Okay. And of course, if you have problem with your internet access, um, say, for example, you don't have a Wi-Fi or you have a limited internet data or slow internet access that you cannot see um, an online lecture like this, again, do let me know. Um, we, we can probably think about something, um, a different way to do it. Uh, now, um, so as, as I mentioned last week, we only will have three synchronous le lecture, like uh, live face-to-face -face lecture like this. And only these three lectures um, that will count for your attendance. Okay, so for your attendance, we only have these three lectures. For all the asynchronous lectures that I'm going to post, there is no attendance. You don't need to, to key in any attendance and whatnot. Um, it's not a requirement, so uh, I will not do that. Okay, so as long as you attended all these three lectures, which is the uh, one is last week, one is today and another one um, is the week before the final exam. Okay, as long as you attended those three, then I'm fine. Um, there, there won't be any issues in terms of you are not, you, you won't be able to attend um, your final exam. You won't be sick for your final exam. So as long as you attended those two lectures, then you are safe. You, you can attend the final exam. Now, um, and one more thing that I will do is uh, to look at your understanding of the course. So what I will do is I will post a, a short quiz um, next week. Okay, not this week, but next week. So at least we, we already covered like three, um, uh, four lectures. So two synchronous and two asynchronous. I'll post a short quiz and it is as a practice at your own time. Okay, it's by no means is compulsory for you to do and by no means there's any mark for it. So it's just a practice on your and what might be improved or what can I improve for the next um, 10 weeks or 10 lectures or so. All right, so last week we have looked at um, what is biotechnology. Um, so this week and the following weeks, hopefully we'll focus on this. Um, I'm planning to do this, uh, well, at least cover up until um, probably isolation or we did that. We will do that um, this and this um, this week. Okay, so hopefully we can um, cover the isolation and purification by the week after and this up until here will be in your quiz number one. Okay, so at least that's, that's the plan. So this will be your quiz number one. 
and then uh, application of enzyme in industry and fermentation or cell technology will be under quiz number two. Right, and everything else will be again. Um, so that one is for quiz one, and everything will be in your final, or well, at least it's related to your final. Okay, so th so that's that's my plan for you guys. Okay, so the learning outcome or LO for today um, is one classification of natural products according to um, structure and metabolic pathway because we well, for today it won't we, we won't touch anything about metabolic pathway uh, we look at the structure um, a little bit um, and then to illustrate the use of biochemical and biotechnological method in chemical and chemistry we will look at the theory a little bit okay um, and today's secret code for the attendance is enzymology um, again the um, attendance link it's already posted in um, Spectrum. So just use the same link. Just put in the today's secret code for your attendance. All right, so previously on um, our previous lecture, we've looked at the definition of biotechnology. Okay, and um, we, we looked at a little bit on how biotechnology is applied um, in chemistry. Okay, so we will look at those these three technologies, uh, we look at the cellular technology, genetic technology, and enzymatic technology in very brief. Um, and we, we looked at the uh, path that it will take. So that one should be there. Um, this is because um, I'm looking through an iPad. So the images is a bit off. Okay. So the arrows should be somewhere there. Okay. We looked at um, the how this technology influences what whether it's a current in vivo or in vitro, and then um, the outcome of each technologies. Okay, um, just a very brief. So today we look at um, the classification of an enzyme, and we look at the kinetics of um, enzyme. Okay, so um, just to show you on the left hand side is the um this is what we call as pdb id okay p means protein data bank um id is identification um that is the identification number for uh, hrp c1a so it's an enzyme it's uh, an enzyme that can be used to oxidize substrate okay um and this enzyme is widely used uh, as a biotechnological tool so i just want to show you where you can get it so one is pdb all right so pdb um, dot org you can get all the different um uh, shape chains and um crystal structure of enzymes and um that is the one example one enzyme example that is related to um, chemistry and biotechnology Um, so some of you might have set for um, my course last year. Okay, so some of the images might be um, repetition, but uh, I, I try to segregate them because uh, last year you were in your second year, this time around you, you are in your third year. So I'm trying to give uh, you more information about um, something that you'll be learning today. So what is an enzyme? So an enzyme is the machinery of life. So there's no life without an enzyme. So you always have enzyme, you always have enzyme in all living things. And um, you do also have enzymes in, you know, like viruses. So even though you might consider it as a non-living organism, but you do have enzymes in uh, some of them, not every viruses. So enzyme has a specific um, duty to role, uh, duty to play um, in the bodily function. Again, uh, life, you have a body, and then uh, inside there you have an enzyme that function in a certain way. So enzymes uh, or, or polypeptides or proteins um, is made by a polyamide bond in nature and form a distinct 3D structure as shown um, in this figure here. Again, this is the HRP protein. 
Okay, and um, you, you can actually see um, some structure, um, some chemical structure, for example, there in the middle there, you can actually see all this chemical structure. But what is shown here is the what we call as ribbon representation. Okay, so this um, ribbon like figure is the ribbon representation, even though you, you do have uh, a beta sheet, but um, we, we call this general uh, figure or image as a, a ribbon representation. Okay, so um, it forms a distinct 3D structure. So that, this is where the question comes in, why? Okay, so why does it form a distinct structure? Um, well, the answer is because of, well, you were talking about, about chemistry, it goes back into our general first year chemistry, Gibbs free energy. Um, if you don't recall what Gibbs free energy is, go back and, you know, um, try and, and figure out a little bit. But what we will look at here is how, um, well, just tiny bit, not in detail, how Gibbs free energy influences um, enzyme kinetics and functions of enzyme. Okay, so enzyme also has um, a few levels, okay, a few folding levels. Um, first, or folding levels of structure. First, we have a primary structure, which is just the sequence of amino acid. We have the secondary structure whereby the amino acid sequence fold into a certain configuration, whether it's alpha helix or a beta sheet, a random coil. Um, and then we have a tertiary structure is where the interaction of a few secondary structure form a more distinct structure as for example uh, over here if you actually see these two alpha helices okay that one over there connected to um okay that one's connected to a different one and then it will come back into forming another alpha helix so these two helix are connected and 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 are kind of like communicating with one another. Not communicating as in talking, but they are hydrogen bonding. There are some interactions between those two alpha helices forming um, this tertiary structure. Okay, so not just with, not not just the two alpha helices, but the whole structure contains a lot of alpha helices. Some has uh, a beta sheet. And you do have some random coils like that on, on that side. So all of these are actually interacting with one another and also, of course with the solvents uh, surrounding it to form this distinct structure. Okay, And that's what we call as a tertiary structure. A quaternary structure on the other hand is where um, a tertiary structure is where you have these, okay, this um, uh, enzyme in a single polypeptide. Okay, so we have one single polypeptide and then it folds and it, it becomes a HRP, for example. Okay, a quaternary structure is where you have a few of these polypeptides and it folds on itself. Okay, so this one folds the first one, second one, um, the second one forms another second. Uh, enzyme or, or protein, third one forms the third one and fourth one forms the uh, a fourth structure. And then all of these four different um, polypeptides interacting with one another forming a quaternary structure. And normally uh, if say the enzyme works in a, you know, a certain configuration, so if it works, and normally it's either a third, um, uh, a tertiary structure or a quaternary structure. Okay, as an example, uh, a clear example is our hemoglobin. So we have a hemoglobin in our red blood cells. Okay, hemoglobin doesn't work on its own. It actually has four subunits of polypeptide. So it's actually exactly as what I've I've drawn here. Um, hemoglobin has four different subunits to make it function as a hemoglobin. So if you only have like one, uh, it doesn't actually work. You need to have all four to actually work in a proper manner, in a biological manner. Okay. Um, and then uh, from here, 
you do have uh, stabilizing forces, you have hydrogen bonds, you have uh, a salt bridge, you have uh, a disulfide bond, you have a London Davidson force, you have a pi pi interaction that are actually interacting with one another, interacting within the same molecule, within, within the same uh, enzyme and holds it together. Okay? So without all these forces, the enzyme will be just a, a linear chain of um, polypeptide. Okay. Um, and when we are talking about the structure of uh, protein, generally we have these two, um, uh, nowadays we have more than two, but by principle, you only have these two types of um, bigger structure. So one, you call it as globular and non-globular structure. Okay, globular structure means that if you have a very long polypeptide chain, it folds up kind of like a ball, okay? Um, again, a clear example is this um, HRP protein where so without looking at the ribbon representation, you can actually see on the surface, it, it forms kind of like a ball. It's not a, a clear surface ball, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, uneven surface, but it, it forms like a ball instead of um, a linear polypeptide chain. Okay, and this is because it has a structural water. So normally when we talk about solvents, when we talk about water, we, we just talk about it as, as a solvent. Okay, um, we, we don't really care about it. Uh, we don't really talk about it in very detail. But in terms of protein and peptides, um, the structural water plays a very critical role in keeping the structure um, of the protein intact. Why? Because if the structure is not intact, if the structure falls differently towards the end of the day, it, 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 the protein will lose its function. So in order to keep the function, um, there are structural water that are kind of like embedded together with the enzyme. Again, if uh, I, I want to show you, hopefully you can actually see this. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. But if you, if you print it, um, or even without printing it, Please open the file and zoom into the uh, to this picture. You can actually see small dots, which um, I don't think you can actually see in Google Meet. So there are actually small dots scattered around um, the enzymes. Okay, um, and these are what I mean by the structural water. So this water, these water molecules, they will stay with the protein even uh, after you did a lyophilization, okay? Uh, what is lyophilization? Um, lyophilization means that, say for example, you synthesize these uh, proteins in a test tube in the lab, okay? So you have a lot of solvents. So say for example, um, say two meals of solvents, okay? And then dissolve in the solvent is your enzyme. So what you do with the lyophilization process is you want to evaporate all the solvents but leaving your enzymes or proteins or peptides in, inside your test tube. Okay, so that is what lyophilization process means, meaning that it evaporates all the uh, solvents uh, in, in very simple terms. Okay, but even if you lyophilize this um, solution, what leaves what what left behind in the test tube is actually uh, what we call as the structural water so this water stays within uh, a close proximity to the um, uh, enzymes and it doesn't actually evaporate because there is a very strong interaction between um, the solvents and the uh, the polypeptide itself okay um, and a flexibility is a, a key feature that influences the globular or non-globular protein. Uh, this sentence is not related to the structure of water, it's more on the globular and non-globular structure of um, the protein. We will look at the uh, structural um, de in more detail, hopefully on uh, this Wednesday. Okay, uh, we still within the same scope. What is machinery of uh, enzyme is the machinery of life, global structure, structural water. Okay. All right. So now you can actually see all of these. So this plus sign is actually water molecule. Okay. So these are the structural water molecule that um, uh, 
uh, I, I've talked about. And um, yes, it, and um, what actually happened is that the um, polar um, amino acids, so you do have polar amino acids, whether it's a, a, a positive or negative charge, is actually interacting with this water molecule. The O doesn't come up, so it's just H2. Right, it should be there. Okay, so so the plus is actually water molecule and it's actually interacting with um, the, the, the polar, uh, whether it's a polar charge or polar uncharged amino acid. This what makes it, this what makes the structure stays intact and uh, even doing a life transition, the water molecule is still there because the bond is very, very strong. Okay, and um, say, without looking at, without thinking about the life transition process, um, this water molecule actually helps in, in the movement of the enzyme. Because again, when you see a picture, it doesn't mean that the um, enzyme is actually uh, static, okay? So enzyme is like a cell. So normally when you, you draw a cell, you, you draw it just like that with a nucleus in the middle, uh, you know, looking at somehow the cell doesn't move. But in reality, all of these are, um, you know, moving in a dynamic form. So similarly for enzymes, they are not just static like that. So it's, it's actually moving um, for, for it to have a certain function. And we, we will look at the uh, movement in more detail soon. All right. So um, some preju prejudices and advantages of enzymes. So when we were talking about enzymes, especially in a chemical point of view, so these are some of the things that, um, you know, some people might say, oh, I, uh, I, I don't want to use enzyme for my research, or I don't want to use enzyme for this reaction, because of first one, enzyme is sensitive. What it means is it's sensitive to change in pH, change in temperature, because in reality, they do have this sensitivity. But the advantage is, normally it's highly compatible with one another. So if say you have two different enzymes, um, one of them is working as an oxidant, the other one is uh, a reduction. If you put this enzyme in the same uh, beaker, okay, in the same beaker with your uh, reagents, so what will happen is your reagent will be converted from the, uh, uh, either from a normal form and then it will get oxidized and then it will be released from the enzyme and then the reducing enzyme will, will capture that one and then reduce it. So the cycle continues non-stop. So this is the advantage. But uh, this is a, a bad example, but it, it, that's the advantage. But if you compare to a, a full chemical reaction in the lab, uh, to do an oxidation and a reduction, you cannot do it in, in one uh, test tube. So you normally need to do one oxidation first once the oxidation is completed, then you do a reduction. Because if you just mix the reducing agent and the oxidation agent, nothing will happen to your reactant. But an enzyme, you can mix two of them together, and then the reaction will still work. Okay, so that's, that's one advantage. The second preju um, prejudice about enzyme is, you know, it's, it's expensive. Again, yes, it's true, it might be expensive, a little bit, uh, but nowadays the price is getting lower and lower. But the advantage is um, the enzyme can be recycled. Okay, so if it can re be recycled, then it saves cost. So, for example, you buy it once, 100, 100 ringgit, 100 dollar, you, you can use it for six months compared to a chemical reaction. Once you add the reagents and reactants or, or catalysts, normally, you know, you just throw it away, right? And additionally, an enzyme, even though it's expensive, the reaction is very, very rapid. So an oxidation process, uh, we will look at more example in, uh, in the rapidity or the kinetics of enzyme soon. The third one is only active in their natural substance. Um, again, some people might say that enzyme is very specific to one substance, but in reality, that is not really true because um, they, they, they are not, um, active in only one substances, but in one, say, functional group. So if you have an alcohol, ethanol, for example, and you want to reduce it, uh, the same enzyme can be used to reduce 
uh, not just ethanol, but probably butanol, propanol, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you know, and and the reaction is very rapid. So it, it doesn't have only one natural substance. Substance they, they are actually multiple, and uh, people now are discovering more and more substances that can be used for uh, an enzyme. Okay, uh, but in contrast, the advantage is um, the catalysis, the, the biocatalysis is very, very efficient. Um, it works in a wide range of condition. Okay, like for example, a um, uh, wide range of pH, uh, a wide range, uh, a wider range of temperature. But for a chemical reaction, some is very, very sensitive. You need to do it at low temperature to get like a very distinct um, uh, product. Okay, and so it can also be not restricted to just their role. So when you say it's only one natural substance, they are actually not really true because they are of specific function of an enzyme. And um, if we have time, we'll actually see it um, in the industrial section, but otherwise uh, we, we will see it later. And then uh, next one is, or, you know, the terminology is of specific or a broad spectrum of enzyme. We will see some of our examples soon. And the Fox prejudice is only active in their natural environment. So natural environment, meaning that, you know, normally people say enzyme works only at pH 7. But again, that is not true. Um, it, it can work at pH about 6. So when you say 7, it's normally around 5.5 uh, to 8.5. It still works. It doesn't mean that it, it doesn't work at all. It still does work. but at a lower um, kinetic, at a lower capacity. But the advantage is when you're talking about environment is enzymes are environmentally acceptable. So if you do an oxidation reaction using an enzyme compared to if you are using um, KMnO4, okay, so you cannot throw away KMnO4 directly into the sink, but for an enzyme, once you finish your reaction, if you don't want to recycle it, you can just simply throw it away in the sink. Um, they are, you know, environmentally acceptable to do that in many cases. I, I won't say all, but in many cases. Okay, so um, some classification of an enzyme. So as of this writing, there are about, oh, as of last week actually, there are about 27, uh, 275,000 uh, proteins have been identified as enzymes, okay? So these are the specific proteins that is counted as enzymes. So enzymes meaning that it's, it's doing something. It's, um, it, it's function as something. Okay? It's not just simply a, a structural protein. Structural protein is a protein that does not really function. You know, you, you want to have an enzyme because you want, you want the enzyme to have a certain function, a chemical function. Uh, we are not talking about structural protein where it does nothing. Okay, so um, there are about 275,000 enzymes, different enzymes that chemists can actually play around and use. Okay, a total of proteins it went up into uh, millions, like I can't remember exactly on top of my head, uh, but it's, it's around millions, including all structural enzymes and enzymes or proteins that is yet to be identified with the, what are the functions. Okay, so there are so many enzymes and, and even nowadays, even though it's already like in 2020, there are still a lot of uh, proteins that are currently unknown uh, about the functions. Okay, so when we're talking about the classification of enzyme, um, internationally, the identification is based on um, this naming system. Okay, so the, the naming system always starts with EC. Uh, EC means enzyme commission. So for this enzyme, it will start with EC followed by uh, four different numbers. Um, so for this one, it donates just A, B, C, and D. So A is the main type, uh, B is the subtype, C is the uh, nature, natural or substrate, and A is the unique enzyme number. So again, um, why do I introduce HRP in the first place? Because of this. This is an example of the uh, classification of HRP. So in the future, when you say, if you're still working in research and you are interested in doing uh, enzyme kinetics or enzyme uh, chemical reaction, these are some of the things that you need to know. And when you do your reporting, uh, you, you need 
you definitely need to report this. If you use HRP for your reaction, you will definitely say um, HRP protein um, open bracket EC 1.11.1.7. Okay, so why do we have this? Because these are very specific. Uh, this HRP is very specific to C1A, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is the structure from, even though it says horse, horse radish paracidase, it doesn't mean that it's, it's from horse, okay? Um, it's from a plant, if I'm not mistaken, it's from a plant. So this number is specific for HRP from that particular plant. So if you take a different plant and then extract that out, the enzyme, and the function of the enzyme is also an oxidation, uh, oxidative enzyme. So it will have a different um, identification number, but the category can still be the same. It can still be a HRP. But HRP for plant A is different than HRP uh, identification number from plant B. Okay. So if you read uh, journals, for example, and, and you are interested in enzymes, always go back and look for um, this four-digit number. Okay, uh, more slides on the classification. This enzyme can further be classified into um, seven categories. Um, reference to, okay, so if you look at that reference to 26, but most recent data added to seven. Oh, okay. Um, reference to, if you look at the book, um, the book says there's only six. Um, but a, most, a more recent data added a seventh category. So um, that's why I, I highlighted it here. That's the book. If you, It depends on what book you are using. Even though it's uh, based on reference to, it's a book. But if, it, if you are looking at the um, older version, then there's only six. But um, nowadays, uh, in, in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, um, 2018 or 2019, if I'm not mistaken, a seventh category is um, is, is decided to be written as part of the um, classification. Okay, so the classification is based on normally type of reaction, uh, normally, but, you know, if, if you just do it based on uh, the type of reaction, it, we will have a very tolerance for natural substrate. So if, say, you just classify it as an oxidation um, enzyme, so enzyme A can might be able to only oxidize and uh, substrate A. So enzyme B, uh, even though the function is the same, which is oxidation, but it might be able to oxidize um, a different substrate. Okay. Um, also, the practical application of the organic synthesis overlap between groups. So uh, we will talk about it in more detail later. Okay. So just remember the application in organic synthesis as a chemist uh, overlaps between groups. And identification is due to the use of crude enzyme extract. So most of uh, the enzyme uh, being categorized is based on a crude extract. So it's not really the um, a pure enzyme. So what happened is, you know, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to get like a very single pure enzyme. Uh, sometimes when you purify it, you think that it's only one, but there can be a, subs uh, a subset of the enzyme that are actually still in the mix that do the function that you think that uh, the other ones are actually doing. So, um, so that's, that's, that's why, you know, in terms of um, a chemistry, you know, this thing is a bit you know, still difficult to manage. And many reaction can be done in cell, so, uh, microbials. So, what it means here is that sometimes you do have to extract the enzyme to, um, you know, to, to, to use the function. So you can also use uh, bacteria or living cells to actually perform the function that you wanted. And we will look at it, um, you know, an example for that in more detail in the coming uh, weeks. Okay, so more classification. So these are the seven uh, groups that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. So the first one is um, oxidoreductase, where the uh, function is mostly a reduction and oxidation. Um, 
for example in, in more detail you, you can read that oxy oxygenation of ch bonds cc c double bond removal of um, additional of hydrogen equivalence and so on and so forth second group is uh, transferases um, it transfer functional groups and you, you all know in the chemistry when you want to create a functional group is a bit tedious uh, but using enzyme you know it, it can be as simple as that um, the third one you can have a hydrolysis where it hydro hydrolyzes or, or formation of or functional groups again um, this is what i mean by the function can be overlapping so one is a transfer of functional group the other one is a formation of functional group when you're talking about functional group it can overlap in terms of chemistry but for a, uh, a biochemical standpoint they, they they like to separate those two um, categories to, um, together or to to separate those two categories you can also have a uh, lysis which um, it adds or eliminates the small molecules uh, like those ones again in a chemistry standpoint it's a bit difficult to do this but enzymatically it's possible and you know when you have it in enzyme meaning that in our body we are regularly doing this the third one uh, the fifth one is isomerases well, it's, the name is very um, uh, you know it talks about itself it isomer it forms an isomerization resumization cyclization arrangement epimerization and so on and so forth um, the sixth one is ligases so it's it like it, it it converts uh, uh, conjoins two different um, functional groups or, or structures together. Okay, so it, it can cleave CO. It, it can also form some of these bonds. Um, for example, with concomitant triphosphate. So as an example, but there are more examples uh, that we might uh, see in the future. And the seventh one is translocations. Translocations where it's um, a transfer of molecule across a membrane. So why is this part of a chemistry? Because you can move a proton, okay, which is very critical. If you can move a proton, meaning that um, you, know, you, you can transfer an energy, you can transfer energy from one form to another, and it might be beneficial for you uh, for some of your reaction if you want to. Okay, um, and these are some of the uh, functional groups that are related to the uh, category that, that um, I've mentioned. Okay, so you, you can just read it. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's there in your lecture notes. I'm not going to touch about that. Okay, uh, we have probably about five more minutes. I'll just touch about this in a bit detail. And then after afterwards, everything else will be um, as an asynchronous lecture. So how does enzyme works? So basic principle is that you have an enzyme, okay, and then you have a substrate that has uh, a similar um, shape to the active site. So we call this as active site, okay, and the substrate has uh, a surface that is complementing to the enzyme, okay. The once that happens what you will get is um, an enzyme plus substrate complex. This is where the reaction will happen. And then finally, um, the original substrate will become a product. So you might have um, two different products. Okay, this is an example. Okay, two different products. So that's, and then this enzyme can again um, take a new substrate and the process continues. So that's why the enzyme uh, reaction is very um, rapid. And um, an example over here is uh, lactose. So lactose is uh, you is a combination of a glucose and lactose. Okay, a glucose and a lactose, and using um, and and by combining those two together you will have uh, uh, a lactose, okay? This bond can be formed using lactase. Okay, so this is the enzyme. So this enzyme, well, that's, that's why uh, when I draw the figure, the figure shows like this, because um, you can have glucose or lactose over here, and um, 
Hello. Sorry, galactose. Lactose. Okay, so you have lactose. Initially, you have lactase here. So a combination of lactose and lactase uh, forms the enzyme substrate complex. And then finally, you, you, you will have a glucose and uh, a galactose as a separate um, entity. So a basic principle of how enzyme works. And, hope, and I think this should be our last slide for today. Um, so there are a few theories um, kind of like explaining on how enzyme actually works. So for you, you might not you, you might think that this is not important and it sounded like more biology. But when you look at, when you go into uh, reaction kinetics, which is the uh, core for uh, a chemistry, where, you know, you have a reaction A plus B equals to C and you want to calculate the, the energy, you need to calculate the delta H, uh, delta TS, entropy and whatnot. So these two models or these two theories actually help scientists to figure out whether this enzyme is better than that, if they belong to the same the same family, and um, you, you want that to have the same function using the same substrate. So which enzyme do you use? So to do to to know which one is better, you need to do this. You need to calculate. You need to do experiments. So and just by doing it without having a basic theory on how the principle actually works, you you, you might be like you know you might have no idea how it actually works. Okay, you might not be able to do your calculations and towards the end you might not get the uh, delta H, the energy that is consumed and whatnot. So um, that's that's why we have these theories that will try to explain um, and, and relate back to how this uh, related to enzyme kinetics. Okay, the first one is we have um, a lock and key model. Um, we'll talk about it in, in more detail in the off slide and second one is an indicate model. So these two models are related, but uh, a lock and key model is like when you have a lock and key, so the, the lock doesn't really move, right? So the, the only moving part is when you put the key in and then you open it, then it, it moves. Okay, but in reality, enzyme is a dynamic. As I mentioned, it, it's constantly flowing. It doesn't stay static. So this theory by Emil Fischer in 1894 uh, uh, doesn't really tell some of, uh, a uh, doesn't tell principally on how some of this um, enzyme actually works. So in 1958, Daniel Kochland um, described this phenomenon of uh, induced fit theory, meaning that enzyme are actually moving. Even when they are doing some function, they are still moving. So that's why um, when people say enzymes are not are, are very specific to one substrate, it's actually wrong because you know the flexibility uh, accounts for different uh, substrate that the enzyme can uh, actually uh, use and have a reaction. Okay, so uh, we will look we will look at it in more detail um, afterwards. Um, but just for your info, some other. Um, Examples are a solvation theory and conformation selection. But you know, if, if you are interested in enzyme um, chemistry or enzyme kinetics, you might want to read it. But otherwise, we will just focus on lock and key model and induced fit model. Okay, uh, and in the, all the other lectures, um, the terminologies that I will use for enzyme is just E. Substrate is S, and enzyme substrate complex is E plus S. Okay, and, and finally, product is abbreviated SP. So these are the, the critical um, information that you need to remember and, and hopefully uh, yeah um, it, it will make sense uh, once you um, once we look at more examples in more detail. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Uh, it's already 12:50. I will stop here. Um, so starting from here onwards, I uh, will do a. Um, uh, asynchronous lecture. I will count it as an asynchronous lecture, and um, you, you can have a look at it. And um, whatever it is, we will have a quiz uh, which include all of uh, the synchronous and asynchronous lecture. Okay. Um, thank you, and um, see you guys face to face um, in in week twelve. That's it.